get right into it. This lecture today is one of my most exciting and in-depth lectures. It's called Christ Was a Buddhist. Now, the messenger of the Buddha, Nitrin Shonen, wrote in the Ghost Show, and the Ghost Show is called Opening of the Eyes. He says, there are three types of doctrines that are to be studied. There are Confucianism, Brahmanism, and Buddhism. Our world for thousands of years has been in a perpetual battle of Brahmanism versus Buddhism. The root of most of the problems in our society stem from the battle of Brahmanism versus Buddhism. I have been a Buddhist for 42 years and I have been a Nichiren Buddhist for 40 years. I joined a Buddhist organization called NSA or Nichiren Shoshu of America. Nichiren Shoshu of America was the genuine introduction of Buddhism to emerge in Western civilization. The parent organization of NSA is the current SGI or the Soka Gaikai of America. There was a clear line of demarcation between NSA and SGI Buddhism. We early Buddhists came from the hippie and black revolutionary background. Please understand that it was only 50 years ago this year that civil rights that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the harbinger for a modern America. In the 1960s when Buddhism came to America, America was a segregated society. We black people could not vote, work certain jobs, live in certain neighborhoods. In fact, interracial marriage was against the law. When I joined NSA in 1974, Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated in Memphis just six years earlier. And I was a teenager when I joined the Black Liberation Movement with history makers who actually were part of the Civil Rights Movement. At 19 years old, I was a delegate for the first black political convention held in Gary, Indiana in 1972. I was among the who's who of black history in America. When I came into Buddhism, brother, I was like this, this fiery 19-year-old guy, and I had the big afro, and I had the dashiki, and I had all the black rhetoric because I came up during the time of the black revolutionary era. Me and many of the hippies joined NSA as a movement for change and revolution. I had the big, I had the dashiki, the big afro, and the black rhetoric, and many of the hippie whites had the long hair and many of us were part of the anti-Vietnam War movement and part of the early uh, rock movement. We were really cool. You will find true revolutionaries in Buddhism. You will not find the true revolutionaries in, in Buddhism today. Now, one of the greatest and worst things in my life uh, was meeting the current SGI leader, Daisaki Kate. I didn't actually meet him. But uh, I really followed his teachings. And the SGI leader taught us how to be Americans again. In fact, Buddhism gave me a means of how to integrate back into society. I cut my long hair, got rid of my dashiki, and I used my Buddhist skills to become a five-time world karate kickboxing champion. In 1988, uh, we released a semi-autobiographical film about my life, and the story is called A Contemporary Guided. In fact, you can watch the whole movie on the web. Let's look on YouTube, and let's show you a 40-second scene of me that was shot 26 years ago, and I tell in the movie how NSA, or Becoming a Buddhist, had changed my life 26 years ago. Let's watch a scene from the movie. I also 
We're late for the meeting. We next have Anthony L. Mosley giving experience. Yay! Good evening, man. Good evening. Since I've joined NSA, I have changed my views of society, and I have rekindled my desire to attain the American dream. For many years, I've practiced karate. About three years ago, a new sport was born in America called karate kickboxing, and I have made the determination to one day become the world karate kickboxing champion, therefore creating happiness for myself and at the same time bringing happiness to others. Thank you very much. There is a clear-cut reason why Nitrin Shonen wrote in the Go Show, The Open of the Eyes. There are three types of doctrines that are to be studied. They are Confucianism, Brahmanism, and Buddhism. The absolute way to understand that Christ was a Buddhist is for you to get a clear-cut understanding of Brahmanism and Buddhism. The best book to learn about the history of Brahmanism and Buddhism is for you to study the 1833 book, The Anaclipsis, by British historian Godfrey Higgins. British historian Sir Godfrey Higgins, in his 1836 book, writes about religion and he specifically talks about the Buddha. He writes, the religion of Buddha of India is well known to have been very ancient. And the most ancient temples scattered throughout Asia, where his worship is yet contingent. He is found black as jet, with the flat face, thick lips, and curly hair of the Negro. Several statues of him may be met with in the Museum of the East India Company. There are two exemplars of his broadening on the face of the deep upon a coral serpent. To what time are we to allot this Negro? He will be proved to be prior to the God called Krishna. He must have been prior to or contemporaneous with the Black Empire supposed by Sir William Jones to have flourished at Sedum. The religion of this Negro God is found by his ruins of his temples and other circumstances to have been spread over an immense extent of country, even to the remotest part of Britain, and to, what to have been professed by devotees inconceivably numerous. I very much doubt whether the Christianity of this day is professed by more persons that yet profess the religion of Buddha. Of this I shall say more hereafter. Now, later in the book, Godfrey Hickens writes, he says, in consequence, of the prejudice of a Negro be learned and scientific arising from an acquaintance with the present Negro character, I admit with great difficulty the theory of all the early astronomical knowledge of the Chaldees were originally Negroes, but this prejudice wears away when I go to the precursors of the Brahmins. The Buddhists, when I reflect upon the skill in their fine arts which they must have possessed when they executed the beautiful and the most ancient sculptors in the museum of any house, and the knowledge of astronomy shown in their cycles of stones, that the Buddhists were Negroes, the icons of the gods clearly prove. Unquote. Please understand that the seemingly battle of Buddhism versus Brahmanism is like a living horror movie. The real story is so frightening. Please understand that the religion of Brahmanism has such a massive influence on our world history and society that its teachings has retarded the evolution of us as a human species. 
the best way that I can teach you about Brahmanism and its recessive hold on human evolution is for me to show you a movie scene from the popular movie Planet of the Apes. The difference, however, is that Brahmanism's hold on human evolution is real. There is a perpetual battle today in this world. Evolution versus creationism. This is actually the story of the Brahmins. When you look at the Brahmins and you look at the planet of the apes, it's really a story of black versus white. It's like real. Now, when the Indo-Europeans reached South Asia, they gave themselves a name called Aryan, meaning noble one. They traveled with a host and the Latin meaning enemy. Their supreme was Peda, meaning father. Peda later became Brahma. The Aryan warlords in India and their priests created a warped and perverted religious order called Brahmanism that created a theological model that infected not only India but the Hindu faith with its religious sanctified racism and sexism created a world model that trampled on the human spirit. Let's take a look at a scene from the Planet of the Apes and it shows you an idea about Brahmanism. Let's take a look at this Brahmanism. Let's look at the Planet of the Apes and show you how it's exactly like Brahmanism. One day they'll tell a story and some will say it was just a fairy tale. Get him out and get him clean! Brutality is law. Rise when your master enters. The powerful rule by fear. Next you'll be telling us these beasts have a soul. <laughs> is there a soul in there? It's disgusting the way we treat humans. How the hell did they get like this? What other way would they be? If they see you on the street, they kill you on sight. You stay here, you're dead. Which are you from? United States Air Force. I'm going back. Bye. Some humans have escaped. Is there another way out of the city? I can show you the way. They travel with a Declare martial law. We underestimate this human. The hell are they? The story is spreading through the villages. They all want to see this human who defies the apes. Full division! Full battle! Ready! It's over. There's no help coming. You came. Sound the call to march! Get me the spaceman. Understand that Buddhism was in Africa thousands of years before there ever was a religion called Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. The Buddhist religion were the teachings of Hermes Trovagesta. British historian Godfrey Higgins wrote about a world that was once a Buddhist. Archaeological signs show remnants of an advanced civilization that Godfrey Higgins speak about. In every account we find early statues of the black Buddhist god. Godfrey Higgins name, names Egyptians Hermes Trimagestus as the elder Buddha. And he names Shakyamuni Buddha of India as the young Buddha. All of the ancient statues of the Buddha is that of a black man. Now, let us move back to the issue of Christ was a Buddhist. Please understand that British historian Higgins notes that the ancient Egyptians were Buddhists and Hermes Trimagestus was the elder Buddha. Now, the name Hermes Trimagestus, that is the name that the Greeks used when they described him in Greek culture, but he was named Tahiti. You know, he had a Thor by the, um, the Africans or the Egyptians. Now, 
let us look at how Godfrey Higgins described how Brahman teachings got affected in Africa. It was a Brahman who brought their teachings to, into Africa. People got his name mixed up. The word a Brahman later became known as Abraham. The story of Adam and Eve was described by Godfrey Higgins as an age of ignorance. We have people today in 2014 who are fighting the perpetual Brahman teachings of creation theory as opposed to the theory of evolution which is commensurate with Buddhist teachings. Now let me share with you empirical evidence how Buddha became Christ as opposed to how Christ became a Buddhist. The Buddhism or the teachings of wisdom have been around thousands of years before Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Concretely, the Buddha Shakyamuni of in in India ever emerged about 600 years before anyone had ever heard of Jesus Christ. The ancient Buddhist text, the Vinaya Pitika, mentions the Blami of Nubian Sudan in the ancient capital of Ethiopia at Miro around the 4th century before the Christian era. Sakamuni Buddhism was in Africa 400 years before Christianity. Please note that Sakamuni Buddhism was in Africa, meaning Ethiopia, Miro, Egypt, and Aksum. In ancient times, Miro was the Ethiopian capital. Aksum was known in the old days as Abyssinia. We have archaeological evidence of Buddhism and Buddhism being in ancient Africa. Look and read all of the ancient Greek historians, Paterich, Alexander the Great, Doris, Latarius, Strabo, Philo, Judeus, Titus, Phlebus, Clemens, and all the white historians confirm about the Buddhist and Buddhism coming to Greece, Rome, and Ethiopia, and the Aksum, M, Aksum, Egypt, Persia, Babylonia, Arab, Jerusalem, and all over the world. The ancient world knew about the world honored one called the Buddha, who later became known as Christ. Now, let's understand, in our Western culture, we were brought up to believe that the story of Christ was the greatest story ever told. We at the proud Black Buddhist World Association hold that the story of how the Buddha became Christ is the greatest story untold. So, when you study Christianity about the Christian religion, they teach you, or we're taught, that the story of Christ is the greatest story ever told. Well, we at the Proud Black Buddhist Association have the greatest story untold. And the greatest story untold is the fact that Christ was not only a Buddhist, Christ was the Buddha himself. To understand how Shakyamuni's Buddhism got into the Middle East, we must start with the Greek king. Alexander the Great. The story in world history is about Alexander the Buddhist and how the Buddhist religion became part of Greek culture and history. When Alexander went to conquer India, this young boy met with Buddhists in India and it was meeting Buddhism that not only changed Greek culture, Greek culture helped to usher in a new Buddhist paradigm of Mahayana Buddhism that traveled to Asian countries of China, Korea, Japan, and other countries. Before Buddhism had ever, ever even made it to Asia, Buddhism was in Greece. Now, let us look at a picture of a Greek Buddha located in the Tokyo National Museum. Imagine the fact that Buddhism was in Greece over 800 years before it was in Japan. 
Over the years, we have met many Japanese priests who act as if they are the masters of Buddhism. When you study Buddhist history, you learn that the Africans and the early Greeks were Buddhists. Now, let me make a side historical note prior to Buddhist Shakyamuni of India. There existed a black Buddhist culture in the world. Now, Buddhists were not called Buddhists. They were called gymnosophists. Gym means naked and sophist means philosopher. Gymnosophists were the Buddhist priests who made a great influence on Alexander the Great. Buddhism emerged in the world stage as an intricate part of Greek history and development. Gymnosophists were not new to Greek historians who visited Africa. They wrote about these Buddhists. However, it was only when Alexander the Great and his men met with Buddhists that they would change the dynamic of Buddhist and Greek culture. Let us share a great history. Not Alexander was said to have been taught by Aristotle. Aristotle was taught by Socrates, who was black and Buddhist. Socrates had been introduced to Buddhism. And he was a Gnostic, meaning knowledge. Look up the word metempsychosis. It is the same as reincarnation. People, let's understand. Let's go into this Greek history. Now, unknown to most people, who what is known as Hellenist philosophy or Greek culture is an syncretic system of West and East. Buddhism became an intricate part of Greek culture. Just Google the word Greek code Buddhism. Socrates, a Buddhist, taught Plato. Plato taught Aristotle and Aristotle taught a young Alexander. It was no mystery why Alexander the Great was fascinated with Buddhists who were called gymnosophists or naked philosophers when he came to India. The Greek philosopher Pythagoras was a Buddhist. The Buddhists were called Sanmediums. Look at para, look at Pythagoras or the Paragorean theory. Look at the Gnosticism were just Greek forms of Buddhism. The influence of Alexander the Great explains how the Buddha Shakyamuni of India became Christ. See, Buddhism deals with the law of cause and effect. We will give you the cause and effect relationship as to how the Buddha became Christ. When Alexander the Great tried to expand into India, this is the time in our history when the East meets West. Alexander did not make it all the way into India and then he got turned around by the Nadas. We will tell you that story in another lecture, how the Nadas conquered the Miriam Empire which brought in Ahsoka, but that's a different lecture. Now, what happened, however, was the land of India leading up to India that he did conquer, the generous set kingdoms, whereas the Greco-Buddhist syncretic culture emerged that allowed Buddhism to become a part of Greek culture. This culture was called Hellenism. Hellenism was a Buddhist Greek culture people Alexander the Great died, I think around 33 years old. He was a young man. But his generals occupied the land near India and all over the world. And this culture of Hellenism spread it in that part of the world. Now, there are many names that Buddhists would call. They were most known as gymnosophists or Sanmedians. The Sanmedians were the dedicated Buddhist priests who introduced Greek introduced Buddhism to Greek culture. The San readings of India later become known as the Greek religious order known as Essenes. They were the Jewish. The Essenes practiced all kinds of teachings. They didn't just teach, study the teachings of Shakyamuni. They studied the teachings of Hermes. They studied all the great Egyptian sciences. There's a word, word called Therapeutia that comes from the Buddhist word Theravana. The Therapeutia were the Jewish Hellenist Buddhist priests 
Most Christians can follow the story in that they know from Christian history that the Persians conquered Jerusalem and took all the Jews to Babylon. When Alexander the Great conquered Persia, the Greeks let the Jews go back home to Jerusalem. The third Boudier was the Jewish Buddhists who lived in the Hellenistic Greek empires. One such group of Therapeutia were the Essenes. To understand how the Buddha became Christ, let us look at the teachings of the king of Judea called Alexander Janaeus, known to some as King Jonathan, the king of Judea. Let us stop for a minute because what I'm about to say will blow your mind. The Jewish king Alexander Janaeus was a Buddhist. He did not call himself a Buddhist. He was in essence or a priest who lived the Buddhist lifestyle. They were vegetarians, knowledgeable, and they lived in a compound with other priests. The Essenes got into bloody battles. Let, let's take a, a closer look at the Essenes. To get an understanding as to how Christ was a Buddhist, we have to go before the reported time of Christ and meet Hebrew King Alexander Janaeus. Alexander Janaeus was not just some Buddhist in Jerusalem. Alexander Janaeus was the king and high priest in Jerusalem who got into bloody wars with the Pharisees or the Jewish priests. Jewish history tells us of bloody battles between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, the Jewish Buddhist connection happened when Jewish high priest and king Alexander Janaeus became an Essene. Now, let's go back into history. The Buddhist king of Sokka sent missionaries to the Greece hundreds of years before Alexander Janaeus. He sent missionaries known as Therapudia. Now, this name arrived from Theravana Buddhism. Now, a culture emerged in Greece and in that part of the world. Simply put, a group of Buddhists who had a high level of religion were called the Essenes. And the high priest king Alexander Janel was a Buddhist or an Essenes. Now, they simply put, they taught the Buddhist Dharma. How do we know this? The Hebrew king left us a minute coin of the Dharma will. The story of Christ in the Bible is the story of Buddha challenging the Pharisees. Alexander Janaeus lost the battle against the Pharisees and he had to retreat into the mountains. And we heard no more from him until 1946. When someone discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the writings of the Essenes. So that you can understand that Christ was a Buddhist, let's first look at the meaning of the word Christ. The word Christ, or the meaning of the word Christ. Now, the word Jesus represents an individualized level of enlightenment and experience. Christ, on the other hand, represents an epithet, an explanation of the quality of enlightenment reached by Jesus. For this reason, and in the context of Western mysteries, Jesus represents the perfect mode, the inner workings of the purified substance and the vehicle in which the path of awakening the level of Christ consciousness takes place. Now, the word consciousness in Syriac means Messiah, and the Greek Christos means anointed one. As for the word Nazarene, the meaning is he who reveals what is hidden. As for the word Messiah, it has two meanings, Christ or the anointed one and the measured one. Please note 
that Jesus in Hebrew means redemption, and the word Nazara means the truth. Thus, the Nazareth means truth. Jesus has attained Nazareth, perfect spiritual enlightenment, and that he also taught the path to others. Hence, Jesus and his disciples were Nazarenes or Nazarenians, meaning followers of the mystic path to God or pure being. Now, the original apostles used the term Jesus of Nazarene, Messiah, which means Jesus the Nazarenean, the Christ, the anointed one. Anointed and enlightenment is one and the same word. Now, remember, the last name is Christ, the first name is Jesus, the middle name is Nazarene. Hence, the name Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, means the anointed one, the giver of truth, the bringer and source of redemption, the revealer of what is hidden, the enlightened one who has the gift to awaken others. The teachings of Christ in Buddha was originally based on the teachings of enlightenment. In the language of the Christian mysteries, the name Joshua corresponds to Jesus' existence as a heavenly power in eternity, the perfect mode, the initiator and the savior of the Christian mystical mysteries. Hence, it is the transcendent spirit beyond the realm of physical matter. On the other hand, Joshua or Joshua represents Jesus, represents the immanent spirit present within physical matter, the perfect mode. So Jesus and Buddha or enlightenment actually means the same thing. Greek philosopher Porphyry gives an account of black Buddhist people as eating no animal food uh, of the black Pelagi or Loyans as coming to Italy and bringing the black god and his mother along with them. They not only brought the black god and his mother, but they brought his house, the house of Loretto. Look at the pictures that's in the Catholic Church. All of this was done uh, before the Council of Nicaea because these Buddhists came to Italy. Now, let's take this thing a little further. Um, the Sumerians or Sumerians were uh, Buddhist people. They were black and white. Just as the Brahmins incorporated Buddha into the Hindu pantheon, they incorporated the Buddha into the new religion called Christianity. There is no evidence or reference to a man called Jesus Christ outside of the 66 books compiled at the Council of Nicaea called the Bible. Empirical scientific evidence shows us a Buddha as black. Now, the idea of the Buddha coincides with uh, the Bible. Like feet like burning brass, hair like wool, eyes like fire. A black Buddha, the image of a white Christ, comes from the Greek king Platome, named as the Egyptian god Seraphosis. We can look at the early images of the black Hindu god Krishna and his mother in early European churches. Just take a look at the pictures. We show evidence that Buddhism or the Buddhist religion was in ancient Rome and all over that part of the world. In order to understand how the Buddha became Christ, you must get a clear understanding of Buddhism. The essence of Buddhism is the Dharma. When you understand the Dharma, you will uh, get an understanding of Buddhism. In order to understand how the Buddha became Christ, let us look at the teachings of Islam and explain how Islam were once upon a time Buddhist teachings that happened in Baghdad. 
please understand that there is a perpetual battle of Brahmanism and Buddhism in our world. There is Brahman Islam and there is Buddhist Islam. There is a Brahman Christianity and there is a Buddhist Christianity. Let me explain Islamic Buddhism. Now, the one person most noted for the start of Islamic Buddhism is Khalif al Mamun. Now, he was the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, the Dharma is the essence of Buddhism. The Dharma includes the teachings of the Buddha, but the Dharma is not limited to the teachings of the Buddha. The Dharma, explained in a simple way, is understanding natural laws in our universe. When Khalif al mum got into power, he did not believe in the practice of Brahman Islam. In America, we only know uh, Baghdad as an evil place most noted for Hudam Hussein and Arab terrorists. Now, humanity owes a lot to al Mumam and actually Islam or Arabs in that they created what we call a Dharma in Baghdad. Baghdad was actually the center of learning. Like while while most people just think of Baghdad as a bad place, uh Alma Mom encouraged all of the ancient writings to be translated into Arabic. Now translated from abroad Certainly, the Greek teachings were into Arabic. We know that Buddhism was widely practiced in Iran, and we know that the Lodo Sutra was translated into Arabic. Now, under the economic support of al Mumum, he had a place called the House of Wisdom, and scholarship in general was encouraged. I mean, scientists from all over the world came into Baghdad. That's where we got the Arabic numerals. We got algebra, geometry, all the sciences, all of these things, all the medicines and many of the things we have today happened during the golden age of Islam. And it happened because Islam or al Mamam started a culture that lasted three or four hundred years in Baghdad where all of the sciences and the enjoyments of science that we know today came from Arab people. Now, I also want you to understand and learn one thing. Uh, there is a man, his name was Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali. Now, he is known by historians as the single most influential Muslim after the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Within Islam, he is considered a what? Mujadid or renew of faith. Now, according to tradition, it says these guys appear to restore faith. And he worked highly and acclaimed by contemporaries that Al Ghazali was awarded the honorific title Proof of Islam. Now, he is cited mostly for bringing Islam back because what he did was he got rid of all of the Hellenistic philosophy or all the teachings that people learned in Greece and what he did was turn Islam into a closed society or what he did was he took the teachings of Abraham which was the teachings of a Brahman and he brought those teachings back into mainstream society and he closed Arabic people or the Islamic faith to relate to science and culture. And Islam is what it is known today. So the person that's most noted for that is called Al Ghazali. They, he was the man who actually destroyed the Dharma in Arabic country of uh, Baghdad, in Baghdad. 
Let's talk about some of the similarities of Buddhism and Christianity, and we can show you how actually what they call Christian teachings are actually Buddhist teachings. Let's start off with the very number one symbol of the Christian religion. Now please understand that the Christian cross comes from Buddhism. Now on page 230 in the Anaclipsis, historian, historian Godfrey Higgins writes, from the origin of the cross, we must go to the Buddhists and the Lama of Tibet. In Tibet, this cross is called the Dejuri. We hear in America about the, da the Dalai Lama, the Tibetan, they use a cross and the main symbol of the cross comes from Buddhism. This cross means enlightenment. Now, it was not until King Constantine of Rome endorsed the Christian religion that the cross came into being in the Christian religion. But that's the first thing. The main symbol of Christianity comes from Buddhism and it means enlightenment. Let's go to number two. The Christian chant. Amen. Well, the term Amen comes from the Buddhist chant. Om. Om. That's where it comes from. Now, let's go to the third point. Christ in Jesus had 12 disciples. Now, the Buddha had 12 disciples. Christ had 12 disciples. That's the third point. Let's go to the fourth point. The first sermon that Jesus Christ did is a Christ called Sermon on the Mount, where he conquers the devil. Now, isn't it not surprising to you that the Buddha's first sermon, where he also conquers the devil, the devil's called Mara, the temptation of Mara. Let's go to the fifth point. Christ is a story of a virgin birth. So is the story of Buddha. You go to the sixth point, the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son is in Christianity. The story of the prodigal son is in Buddhism. But now understand, Buddhism was around hundreds of years. Now, let's go into it. Okay, like in Christianity, there's God. In Buddhism, there's the unconditioned. In Christianity, there's heaven. In Buddhism, there's nirvana. In Christianity, there's Jesus. In Buddhism, there's Gautama. The Jewish founder of Christianity is Jesus. The Dalai founder of Buddhism is the Buddha. Now, there's the same of a virgin account, virgin account. The temptation of Satan, that's in Christianity, temptation of Martin. The good news of the kingdom of God, the Dharma law of liberation. Sermon on the Mount, Sermon of turning the wheel of the Dharma. Taught in parables, the Buddha taught in parables. Kissed by Mary Magdalene. Kissed by Pasanie, betrayed by Judas, and Buddhism betrayed by Devadatta, crucified, possibly poison, ascension, Parinirvana, the sent the anointed one, the Messiah, the awakened one, enlightened, Savior, on Jesus, Bodhisattva. Now, in Christianity, we have the church, in Buddhism, they have the Sangha. They have the Gospels and Christianity and Buddhism that's the Sutras. In Christianity there's the Bible. In Buddhism there's the Tripatikas, the Parajana, Paramitas, and many other writings. Apostolic succession. You got lineage of the Dharma transmission. Faith promoted three hundred years later by Emperor Constantine. Faith promoted three hundred years later by Emperor Soka. You got the church councils, Buddhist councils, missionaries in Buddhism. Missionaries in Christianity. Monasteries in Buddhism. Monasteries in Christianity. After flowing in the Middle East, now a minority religion in the area of its birth. After flourishing in India, now a minority religion in after its birth. The comparisons of Buddhism and Christianity are so similar. Let me give you about, mm, say, 28 quick things about the, the that compares Buddhism into Christianity. Number one, pre-existence. Two, royal origin and their genealogy. 
three, virgin, virginal conception by mother, virgin birth, four, genes, visions, five, white elephant, white dog parallels, annunciation to the husband, annunciation of birth by woman, righteousness, foster father, nine, marvelous light star, ten, angels in other birth, eleven, the Margie's visit, twelve, giving gifts, presentation in the temple, infant prodigy, precocious youth, fifteen, nature miracle, sixteen, naming ceremony, seventeen, taming the wild animals, eighteen, miracles of the bending tree and gushing water, nineteen, fallen idols, twenty, hidden miracles, twenty-one, sage recognition, Athita, Sam, Salmon Parallel, 22, Anna and Shibari, Old Woman Parallel, 23, Appalachian of the King, 24, Mary Ma Pajarapati Parallel, 25, Fast in the Wilderness, Temptation of the Devil, 26, Preparing the Way, 27, Reference to Signs, 28, Offer of Universal Salvation. We can go on and on and on to show you that what they call the Christian religion is the same as Buddhism. But Buddhism was, Buddhism was around 500 years before the name Christ ever came about. And we showed you that there were uh, missionaries in that part of the country, in Greece, that taught these teachings and they were well into the culture. Let's bring this lecture to a conclusion. Now, the essence of the Council of Nicaea that happened in 325 AD was a battle of Brahmanism versus Buddhism. Now, listen, the Gothic seer named Valentinus narrowly missed becoming the Pope in the second century. The Gnostics were Buddhists. Now, what happened that the Brahmins got into the Papal? Now, it was King Constantine who was a Krishna or a Brahma along with a fanatical group of people called Paulites. The Paulites were a fanatical group of people. And the Paulites got into the Papa chair because the Papa liked the Paul, the Paulites were Brahmins. The Paulites introduced the pernicious dogma of Paul into what later became Christianity. The fight was whether Jesus was a God. The Paulites believed in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to study because this is history. Now, what the Council of Nassau was about was the, there was a bishop. Now, also, this bishop was in Africa. He was a black man. His name was Arius. Now, Arius did not believe in such things because Arius well, Arius was a Gnostic. Arius believed in knowledge and he was a well-learned man. Now, at the Council of Nicaea, a new religion was born called Christianity. This did not just happen with someone faxing a document. A group of men, just over 200, got together and they agreed upon 60, 66 books. They put these 66 books together called the Bible. And they created a leader called the Pope. They gave this Pope an aura of infallibility. And this is how the Christian religion was born. Now, let's go back to Arius. Arius was a bishop in Alexandria, in Egypt. He didn't go along with all of this nonsense, but uh, as we said, there was an issue, there was a fight.
between the Brahmins and the Buddhists. They wouldn't call Buddhists. The Arabs were the Gnostics. He did not believe in that trinity. He didn't believe in all the things that the Paulites had put together. So King Constantine, who was also a Brahmin, who supported the Paulites, called a conference together and they came together to deal with Arius. And once they got together, they created one of the greatest uh, misleading teachings that ever happened in the history of mankind. Because what they did was they propagated the Brahman teachings. Now, when we go back to uh, just after Constantine had passed, they wanted to deal with Arius, and they took all the books of Arius, they killed Arius. They not only killed Arius, they said, we're going to put a stop to this. Now, read your history. Just a few years later, there was an emperor. His name was the Otis. Emperor Theodos gave an order not only to destroy all the teachings of Arius, but he set fire to the library of Alexandria, all of the Egyptians' mystery systems and all of the thousands and thousands of years of Egyptian history and culture and all of the thousands of years of black history was destroyed because it was King Theodos that destroyed this history. Now, earlier there was religious tolerance in the world. And that was once upon a time a thing called the Buddha Dharma, where people learn culture and history, where we all tolerate each other. Now, what happened? is that the Buddhist teachings died because the Brahmins destroyed the Buddhist teachings in India. They destroyed the, all of the Buddhist teachings in the Middle East and there was no more Buddhist teachings. Now, in the 13th century, an interesting phenomena happened in the 13th century. A man who we call the messenger of the Buddha. His name was Nichiren. And he was a priest, and priest in Japanese means shonen. Nichiren Shonen reintroduced to the world the teachings of the Buddha. And these teachings came across in a teachings called the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra was the highest of the Buddha's teachings. And this saying, or this message of the Buddha left for the world or he explained to the world that you can gain all of the ancient knowledge all of the Egyptian mystery systems all of the teachings of the world that have been destroyed by the Brahmins and he gave these teachings and he said you can learn it by just one sentence and he said, you can just learn it by quoting what is called the Lotus Sutra. And the title of the Lotus Sutra is trans translated. It was called Yo Ho Ringe Kyo. Now, it was Nitra who put the term Nam, or Namak, or Namu, which means devotion. He said, you devote yourself to the mystic law of cause and effect teachings, then you are in essence reading the Lotus Sutra because the Lotus Sutra are the living words of the Buddha. And when you chant the teachings of the Buddha or the words of the Buddha, then you can become enlightened. Now, we learned earlier in this lecture that Jesus means attaining an individual level of enlightenment. That Christian or Christ means anointed or Christ means enlightened. The word Nazarene means truth. 
So these are the things that we taught you. Now, it is the pernicious teachings of Paul that went to destroy these teachings because they gave you something outside of yourself because it was the teachings of Buddha and Christ that says thou shalt know the truth and it's the truth that sets you free so we're going to bring this lecture to a close and uh, the Buddha left it into the Lotus Sutra now if you want to know more or you want to get an understanding of the proud black Buddhist association I'd like for you to look at the movie Star Trek when you look at the movie Star Trek you will notice that there were the Ferengis and there was the uh, what's called uh, what's, what's this guy Sparks and the Vulcans and you had different people now on Star Trek, a Vulcan don't stop being a Vulcan, a Ferengi don't stop being a Ferengi, the ship shapers don't stop being a ship shaper. Everybody has their different natures, but they all live together in a federation because we are different people. Even though that I am a the proud, we have the proud black Buddhist association, it doesn't mean that we hate white people or we hate anybody. This is just a cultural identification. Buddhism and true Buddhism is a, is a religion of equality. Well, it's a religion of not only humanity, but it's a religion that is universal. That we all and all beings are able to live together. But right now there's a fight between the Brahmins and the Buddhists. And we are here and we call ourselves the boldest sabas of the earth. Like, what happened was, we grew. And there were some Japanese that brought this Lotus Sutra to us. And today we know about Mam Yohogi Gekyo. And we can begin to now to teach the true teachings of Buddhism. Thank you very much. He is comparatively, I suppose, of the captains, very, very human. He shows, wears what he feels. He is a quick thinker, but yet a deep thinker. He is a single parent, of course, and thus is worried about raising his son. In this case, of course, that he is a, a widower, so that part of his history is there. Especially every time he looks at his son, he is seeing that part of his life, indeed seeing his wife. And we have to assume then that he loved her very deeply. Mm. What? I was just thinking, how much you look like your mom. So there are indeed conflicts human conflicts, which makes, you know, it a, a wonderful experience because you can go, you can play everything. O'Brien to Commander Sisko. Go ahead. Sir, the Enterprise hailed us again. Captain Picard is waiting to see you. Acknowledged. This won't take long. Sisko was ordered <laughs> to come. In fact, we, we find out that he was very much interested in returning to Earth. And at this moment, you know, he, uh, his request has not been, been granted. And he's here, and he doesn't want to be here. And especially, you know, when he has to go and see Picard again. It is not pleasant for him. He also discovers, once he gets there, that the station has been decimated by the Cardassians. So it's not a pretty sight at all. And there's a lot of work to be done. And everybody that he encounters, as a matter of fact, you know, with the exception of O'Brien, perhaps, are not particularly pleased about whatever their situation is on Deep Space Nine. How could I possibly operate my establishment under Starfleet rules of conduct? This is still a Bajoran station. We're just here to administrate. You run honest games, you won't have any problems from me. But certainly, in terms of the relationships, it's, you know, he has to find a way to pull these various factions together. Major Kira, who is a Bajoran national, 
Odo, the shapeshifter, and Quark, <laughs> the Ferengi. I mean, so you have these various cultures coming together, and he has to find a way to bond those creatures, those beings, including himself.